1086. William the Conqueror has successfully held England for 20 years, but it's not an easy task. How can he defend himself and his people? The solution was this. Castles, a stone embodiment of Norman domination. This is my favorite castle in all of England. Here, behind these formidable stone walls, some of medieval history's biggest moments were played out. This is Ludlow Castle. Standing proud on the wild western frontier between England and Wales, Ludlow gives a vital glimpse of how people lived and worked in these stunning spaces and just what Norman power really looked like. For centuries, castles have loomed over the landscape of Britain. In this series, I'm exploring some of our greatest fortresses, investigating how they helped forge a nation and discovering how you build a castle and how you tear one down. Walter de Lacey, the first owner of Ludlow Castle, had crossed the channel with William the Conqueror in 1066. His reward for their success was the earldom of Hereford, close to Wales. Ludlow Castle is located near the Welsh border, in the modern county of Shropshire and stands proudly on the west side of the town. Ludlow offered the ideal location to site a castle. It's protected on two sides by a bend in the River Teem and on a third side by the River Corf. The fourth is sheltered by the town. It makes it so highly defensible here. And it needed to be easy to defend. This part of England was a frontier that demanded constant vigilance. Ludlow sat in this wild west and had to be ready to protect itself against all comers. But what did Ludlow Castle look like when it was first built after 1066? The first structure here in the immediate aftermath of the Norman conquest was made of wood. There was a timber ringwork enclosure of the kind that's quick to construct in hostile areas. The Normans proved impossible to dislodge and by 1085, Ludlow, like other Norman castles in England, was transforming from wood to stone. Three of the towers here at the northeast, northwest, and southwest corners of the Curtain Wall are survivors from that early Norman building. One of Ludlow's interesting architectural features is the arch of stone that we can see in the front of the keep there. That's the old way into the castle. A couple of centuries after it was built, it was bricked up and moved to the side where we access the castle now. This new doorway was positioned to help better defend the castle and to turn the former entrance tower into a more recognisable keep. Ludlow has an inner and an outer bailey. The outer bailey would have been a bustling hub, housing every trade a castle needed, from the blacksmith to the brewer. The inner bailey at Ludlow was home to the kitchens, a well, the great hall, and comfortable apartments. But unlike Bamborough, Ludlow's inner bailey is surrounded by a moat, a moat is a large ditch around a castle which can be filled with water. This can be a barrier against digging or tunnelling under the inner bailey and can help hinder the use of devastating siege weapons such as battering rams or scaling ladders. A drawbridge once sat across this dry moat. 
It's a door that can be lowered and raised when needed to protect the inner bailey from attack. Most of the towers at Ludlow are rectangular, and like many Norman castles, it has a keep. This is the inside of Ludlow's keep, the defensive heart of the castle. And down here, you can still see one of its last lines of defences. These are murder holes. They're literally holes in the floor, but they look down on that original entrance into the castle, so that from here, defenders could drop down anything they wanted on someone attacking the castle. All of these features speak to the need to be constantly on guard. Attack was never very far away. And if enemies were coming, you'd want to have everything you needed to survive inside Ludlow's inner walls. Castles usually had a chapel, so the users didn't need to leave the space during a siege to pray for God's help in their success in war, as well as not having to join the masses in the local church if they didn't want to. Here in the heart of the Inner Bailey stands St Mary Magdalene's Chapel. It was built in the 12th century and it's a rare example of a round chapel that mirrors the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem and links to Templar ideas. There are only four surviving Norman round chapels in Britain and this is one of them. It was commissioned in the early 12th century by Gilbert de Lacey, the grandson of Ludlow's first owner, Walter. The pattern of alternating chevrons and plain carvings around the walls is a fashion from that period. The lower windows were added in the 16th century when a second floor was created. It used to be linked to the Lord's apartments by a tunnel so that they didn't have to get wet on their way to chapel. And it's still an incredibly evocative place today. Ludlow has one mystery that's captured my imagination since I first came here as a child. This is something that had fascinated me for years about Ludlow Castle. My childhood mind went wild wondering what this could be. Castles weren't just built for defence. People had to live here too. And this particular space has a rather cool purpose. As a kid running around Ludlow Castle, I'd convinced myself this was some sort of prison cell, that the moat would be filled with water and people locked in here would be floating as part of their punishment, that the light from above was a way of people checking up on them, but maybe also poking fun at them while they're being tortured. Turns out it's nothing quite so sadistic. Ludlow's moat was never filled with water. The stone's porous so that it was always just a dry defensive ditch. This is Ludlow Castle's medieval fridge. It's cut into the earth of the Outer Bailey so that it's always a few degrees cooler than anywhere else. The curtain walls that surround the Outer Bailey are made from locally quarried limestone. These walls had a crucial role in medieval warfare, providing protection and acting as a deterrent to anyone daring to rebel. Which was especially important in a castle like Ludlow, which was living under constant threat from neighbours in Wales and along the marches. But these walls are also an architectural feat and are a testimony to the skilled craftspeople who created them nearly a thousand years ago. Teams of stonemasons would travel across the country building cathedrals and castles. Even gluing the stones together required unique and specialist knowledge. I'm travelling to a stonemason's yard near Ludlow to meet master mason Ben McMillan to find out how similar his work is to the ways they used to build castles just like Ludlow. Ben, thank you so much for having us. So we've got a nice stone. How do we turn this into a nice looking wall? Now these obviously could be as big as you like. I mean, we could, you could get early cathedral work, castle work. You can get 
units of ashlar, which are, you know, impossibly large for a human to lift. So the lifting equipment that we're going to use today is a Lewis pin. So this is a Lewis pin, which is a Victorian version of the three-legged medieval Lewis pin. In the medieval period, stonemasons building a castle like Ludlow would have used something like what the Victorians called a Lewis pin. It would have had a central pole and had three legs surrounding it, which worked on a hinge. A hole is drilled into the stone and the Lewis pin is added. Once the chain is attached, the distribution of weight means that the legs kick out and grip the internal section of the block, and then we can begin lifting up. So, if you'd like to put it in the hole for us, we've already drilled the hole. Yeah, we'll give this a go. That's it, keep them together at the same height as it goes down. Just, there we go. That's as deep as we're gonna get it. We'll just latch that on there. You can wind that one for me. That's it. That's gonna to begin to lift now. And there we go. Okay, that'll do. We, we wonder how people get to tops of castles, tops of cathedrals and things like that. This is yep. effectively how they more would do chain, it. More chain, more gears, and uh, there's almost nothing you can't lift. Fantastic. So now we know how to lift a block, how do we get these stones together? So what kind of mortar would a, a medieval mason have used to lay his, his walls? He would have essentially used a lime mortar mix. So local sands and lime from wherever they can get it. I mean, we've got the Wenlock Edge here in Shropshire, which used to produce lime. The lime we buy now is hydrated, but it, they would have bought lime putty. That's what would have been available. Lime putty gets mixed with local sands. Now the mortar that we're creating here is not designed to be brittle at all, because you're not, you're not using the mortar as, a, as an adhesive grab. All you're really doing is trying to create a very soft cushion of lime, which will stop the stones cracking each other. So here's one I made earlier. It's nice and smooth. Now the stone is dry that we're about to lay on. And obviously when that stone lands on that one, you're trying to create suction and movement in the mortar to get a fix. And it's gonna take a sip, it's gonna drink the water. Essentially, because the stone is dry, we're gonna wet the stone. And if it goes too dry too quick, you're not gonna get that option. So we're just gonna lay a little bed in here. If we just bring that over. Okay, and when you're ready, if you wanna start winding it down, this one? Yep, looking good. Hang on, steady, steady. Okay, keep going. There we go. We take a sponge. And we'll just clean that down. And there you go. And so on and so forth. Just several thousand more times and you've got yourself a castle. <laughs> yes, exactly that. <laughs> Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.